for bearing with us. Uh, thanks for your patience. Um, good afternoon to everyone, at least those in this time uh, frame. Um, so before we start, yeah, let me remove the mask. As I said yesterday, I don't want uh, language to be a problem. So please interrupt me at any time. And if I'm uh, not clear, uh, I'm taking questions in any, well, in Portuguese and Spanish, uh, at, at least, and in English, and I can translate. So I ask the questions in, in whatever language you are more comfortable with, uh, at, if I'm able to understand it. And okay. So sorry for the technical problems. Just a reminder that you go to the our repository and launch my binder because this may take a little bit of time, and we'll we'll try to run a few um, a few of the of the example notebooks today, right? Okay. So without further ado, let's go to the topic of today. Oh no! Before that, do you have questions from yesterday? Any question from the remote audience or from anyone in the auditorium? OK, good. So please remember, I won't stop a lot. So make questions at any time. Just, just go ahead and interrupt me. So today we are going to discuss a little bit about strong lensing and then weak lensing, which are two aspects of uh, macro lensing. So basically, uh, the, the, the effect we will see, it's visible in some way or detectable in some way in astronomical images and not in the time domain. Uh, although there may be, of course, a time domain effects that we, we measure, but these are macro lensing. We, we see the effect in the shapes. And as I mentioned yesterday, uh, typical effects of strong lensing are multiple images, strong distortions generating things like arcs, rings, large magnifications, large magnifications, and time delays. Uh, I will skip time delays for today and uh, remind you that uh, because of the magnification and since the, the um, surface brightness is conserved, uh, these uh, arcs or Einstein rings, they really focus on us more photons uh, from the source than they would be without a lens. So they really act as gravitational telescopes in the sense of amplifying the flux that gets to us, right? Okay, so again, let's see just a picture of, of how it works. We, we are uh, at Earth observing, there is a lens in between. I don't have the mouse like yesterday and maybe at some point it will appear. <laughs> So that there is a lens. When there is an approximate alignment between the Earth, the lens, and the image, which is shown in green there, and, and the source, I'm sorry, that is shown in green there, um, the, 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 the light trajectories are such that we receive information from a ring around uh, the lens, and that's called the Einstein or Einstein's loss of ring. There are some very nice pictures nowadays, as we will see later. There are hundreds of these systems now today. Um, and um, just to show you, I, I don't think I showed this yesterday, the, the paper by Schlossong where he points out this possible solution of gravitational lensing, it's a couple of paragraphs, right? That's the paper where the uh, published uh, uh, solution of Einstein ring appeared for the first time. But as we, we know nowadays, Einstein has retrieved it before but didn't publish before. Anyway, so we saw yesterday how to Mimic this example using a piece of glass of wine before you fill it. And when, when the, the mass distribution, it's not like a single galaxy, which is rounder and smoother. But if you have like a galaxy cluster, which is a clumpy mass distribution, elongated, you won't see normally Einstein rings around galaxy clusters, but rather you will see arcs, like this very large one that you see in the top right, uh, but also a lot of small arcs that you see across the image especially if you, you see it in your screen. Um, so at some point it was stated that no one predicted gravitational arcs, and when the first arc was discovered, which is this large arc there, but this is a HS image, and it was discovered uh, by an older image from an older telescope. Um, but some people said it was never predicted the arc, so people didn't know exactly the nature of it. But this, this is a scientific American paper, popularization paper by Henry Norris Russell, the same of the, the R of HR diagram. Um, so he was uh, acknowledging Einstein because Einstein has shown him his paper, 1936 paper. And then he hypothesized a situation where you have an alignment of two massive bodies and he predicted the sh shape of gravitational arcs. I don't know if he did any calculation there because it's a popularization paper. Anyway, that's out of curiosity. That's the, the, the first arc that was discovered in the bottom left is Abel 360 or 70, I don't remember. 
Okay, so strong lensing, as, as we said before, it's micro lensing, so we see the effect in the shapes, and that's the realm of galaxies, galaxy clusters. So those are extended mass distributions. What we saw yesterday was uh, micro lensing, so lensing by a point lens or a couple of point lenses. Uh, but here, the, the light will, will, will propagate through the density, non-zero density of the, the lens. So really have to understand what's going on in an extended lens. Also, as we see shapes, uh, we, we, we are not considering the source as an infinitesimal. We have to take care of the shape of the sources. So that's what we will see now. So just to recall what we saw yesterday um, in the, the lensing diagram, we have the source in the source plane. Uh, the rate propagates through space. It's essentially deflected in the lens plane. Um, for clusters and galaxies, it's an excellent approximation. The size of the cluster or a galaxy is much smaller than the distances from the observer to the lens and from the lens to the source. So you can think of every deflection happening in a single plane. And we saw the solution by Einstein of a single point mass deflection. And now if we have an extended mass distribution, um, like this row of psi and r, psi is a coordinate as we saw in the lens plane, and z is or z is in the, the line of sight direction. So that row is a 3D mass distribution. We can compute the projected mass distribution. So thinking that all the mass is projected along the, the lens plane. So we have a 2D mass distribution, sigma of psi. And we can think uh, as, as uh, 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 infinitesimal elements of density, delta sigma, and at a position, uh, let's say, uh, psi prime. So we have a mass element in a position psi prime. And the, the, the mass in this element is just the surface density times the area, okay? So it's sigma of psi prime times d squared psi prime. So that's a mass element. So the, the total deflection, the angle alpha hat, will be a sum of the effects of the deflections of every infinitesimal mass point, uh, mass uh, element, right? Uh, because again, we are in the weak field limit of general relativity. So, uh, the, the deflection angle contributed by this small mass element will just be the mass, which is sigma times the, the, the psi square, times the effect of a point lens uh, centered in psi prime, right? So that's what you see there. So just, and you will sum up there. So you, the total deflection angle is just this integral of uh, the, uh, com the, the, the contribution of each of the mass elements. So. In principle, once we know the mass distribution, we can compute the deflection angle. Once we compute the deflection angle, we have the lens equation, and we are ready to go to do everything we need for uh, lensing. But it's also useful, like we saw in the uh, yesterday, to define a projected potential. So it is uh, computed in, uh, in terms of the Newtonian potential of the lens, this uh, psi, uh, phi here. So uh, it's projected along the line of psi. And you may show that the deflection angle is just the gradient of this function, right? Uh, the uh, reduced deflection angle, that's what will enter in the lens equation, is just given by alpha hat multiplied by the distance from the lens to the source divided by the distance from the observer to the source. And in terms of the projected potential is what's given here. So we may define this combination of distances and c squared uh, as a lensing potential. So the lensing potential is the projected potential weighted by the typical distances that show up in lensing. And we write the lens equation just like, like we, we wrote yesterday, but alpha now is just the gradient of the lensing potential. Okay? And it's from this expression that we worked out yesterday that uh, the Jacobian of the transformation from beta to theta is just the, the um, uh, identity matrix minus a matrix that's the second derivative of the potential. That's from here, right? Just, just here. So this will be our starting point of everything today. Uh, the only difference is that psi will be given by uh, an extended mass distribution and not a point source. Um, if we have spherical symmetry or projected to us, it's an axial symmetry. Uh, what happens is something like uh, the Gauss theorem, actually it is the Gauss theorem, that says that uh, if you are at a distance psi from the center, the whole deflection angle works as if the matter was uh, centered in the center, okay? The mass contained within a circle of radius psi uh, 
uh, will act as a point lens. So this is like the point lens expression, but of course this mass will depend on the distance from the center because it's an extended mass distribution. So uh, the, the lens equation reads like that, and if so, uh, so beta is one minus uh, a mass times these weights divided by theta square times theta. If we think that we have perfect alignment, then we know because of this is spherical symmetry, it will create a ring. And in the case of perfect alignment means beta equals zero. Then we have the Einstein ring and you can uh, show easily that the, the size, angular size of this Einstein ring is just given by this expression. So that tells you that when you, you look at an Einstein ring and you measure its uh, radius, if you know the redshifts of the lens and the source, so that you can compute these distances that show up here, then you know uh, you can estimate directly the mass contained within this Einstein radius. So that's a very simple and efficient way of weighting a galaxy. As we know, there is a lot of dark matter. We don't know how much it is. Okay, you see an Einstein ring, you know the mass within that ring period. Uh, just because of the axial symmetry, you can manipulate that integral and it will give this expression here. Uh, you can do it either by, by just manipulating the integral or you can uh, use Gauss theorem. Yeah. Okay, so let's take a very simple example of a mass distribution that's, uh, of course, it's like a toy model uh, 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 to be showing exact solutions, but it's also a pretty good description of actual galaxy mass distribution. So it's a toy model, but uh, it has its grounds on, on reality. And this is the singular isothermal model, uh, whereas the density is one over R squared. You see that if you compute uh, uh, um, rotation curves of this, this um, mass distribution, it uh, will get, you get, give you flat rotation curves. So in some way, it describes a galaxy or a spherical, um, uh, uh, um, spiral galaxy. But also, it, but in, in particular, it's a very good uh, real description of the mass distribution in elliptical galaxies, okay? Uh, of course, you say, well, but dark matter is NFW. How, how are you using a singular thermos here? Well, uh, if you sum up the, the mass distribution in the baryonic component plus the dark matter, it turns out for some conspiracy, it has been called a conspiracy in a way, that the profile is very close to isothermal, okay? Uh, is this a coincidence? I don't know. But so... Of course, now you can measure 1 over r squared plus uh, epsilon. You can, you can measure um, deviations from the uh, isothermal sphere, but it's close to isothermal sphere. So if, if you, we compute the projected density of this, uh, this component, it's easy to show that will be proportional to 1 over psi. And when you plug this into the mass, and then you plug into the deflection angle, so the mass is proportional to psi, but the deflection angle is mass over psi, so at the end, that gives you a constant deflection angle, okay? Constant, but uh, uh, towards, uh, uh, against the center of the galaxy, right? So it's a constant, but in any point is in the direction pointing against the center of the galaxy, in the radial direction, outwards, okay? Uh, and if you, can, you want to simulate this effect in a medium, just get a cone, a transparent cone, and it will give you the same effect. Okay, so... How does the lens equation read in this case? Uh, again, we know that the angle deflection is constant. Uh, I just put psi hat to show the direction. Uh, we, we wait over for the reduced deflection angle. Uh, this combination, uh, 4 pi times sigma v squared over c squared DLS DOS, we'll call this theta e. It already tells you that it will be the Einstein radius in this case, okay? So the, at the end, the lens equation just reads theta equals theta minus theta Einstein in the direction outwards the radial direction, right? Very, very simple form. So let's look out at the solutions of the Einstein, of the lens equation in this case. Um, we can take the modulus of this uh, the, and then we'll have two solutions, right? One when mine, one minus theta E over theta is positive. Um, then we'll have this solution, beta equal one minus theta e over theta. But it could be that theta is uh, smaller than theta Einstein and the term in the modulus is negative so that the modulus is minus it. So this is one solution, beta is equal theta minus theta Einstein, okay? So 
if I, I give you the position of the center of the source, beta, then the image is theta. It's just beta plus theta Einstein. And that's one of the solutions. And then the other solution is the term in parentheses being negative. We take the modulus. And then what we have is beta equal minus 1 minus theta e over theta, which gives you the uh, lens solution. Sorry, the solution to the lens equation. Uh, theta is equal to theta e minus beta. So what does it tell you? If you are inside, uh, 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 if you are close to the center, let's say at some distance from the center, there are two solutions. There will be always two solutions in this case. Uh, the, this, the mass distribution is singular at the center. Okay, it will always have two solutions. But one solution is uh, your original position plus the Einstein radius, and the other is the Einstein radius minus your solution. So one solution is outside the Einstein radius, and the other is inside the Einstein radius. Okay. But as we said all the time, what's important, it's not the solution of a point source, but a, uh, some, some spatially extended source. So let's take the, the, a, a, a circular source in the source plane, just for uh, concreteness. And it's a very simple one. So what means a circular source? I'm taking a circular source here. So in the, in the parameter space of the, of the source plane, it's just stating that uh, any position beta minus the center of the source, which is beta zero, is given by R, right? So I fix beta zero. All my betas uh, uh, minus R have to, uh, or my betas minus beta zero have to be the, the, the radius of the source, right? So that's the trivial uh, expression of a uh, circle uh, in the beta plane. Now we just work this solution in uh, um, polar coordinates. So in the lens plane, we work in polar coordinates. So beta is the radial direction and phi is the angular direction. And that's, again, uh, as you all know, the expression of a circle in uh, a circle with a center in beta 0 in uh, uh, polar coordinates. There's no lens in there. So now what we'll do is we will apply the solutions that we know on the lensing, right? Which is one solution is uh, theta equal beta plus theta Einstein. So you take beta, the expression in the left, and you just sum up uh, theta Einstein. And the other solution, you take theta Einstein and subtract beta with this expression above. And when you, 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 you vary uh, phi within the, the, the range that it's allowed to vary to draw the circle in the source plane, it will draw these images in the lens plane, these arcs. Okay? So that's a trivial solution just to show you how arcs appear right in uh, analytic solution for the lens and for the source and well okay that's it uh, there is a, a line of code that they, makes it plot but uh, i can put it in the repository just to play around but it's it okay these are analytical solutions for the arcs yes yes oh, nice <laughs> yeah it's very nice uh, simple nice uh, you can generalize this for a, um, for a source at any position and angle phi zero. You can generalize this for elliptical sources. You can generalize this for elliptical lenses. You can generalize this adding uh, um, external shear, adding convergence. So there is a sort of a quite a, a wide range of, of uh, solutions where you can still find these analytical solutions uh, for, the, for the images. Okay, this was a single isothermosphere. In, 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 as I said, it's a good approximation, but in practice, there are many, many other models that are used. Uh, of course, the navarro frankel white model is used. Other models that have been used in the, in the literature to model the lenses. Cersic profile for the mass density, a NASA profile for the mass density. And these are available. Uh, in this case, the flexion angle is uh, numerical. You have to compute it numerically. It's just integrals. Uh, and it's available, implemented in many codes. Uh, okay, we just discussed uh, um, um, circular models, but we can use uh, this circular density distribution and turn it into an elliptical model. Uh, for example, you, you replace your radial coordinate uh, of the density, projected density, so it's a function of theta. You can replace it by just these uh, elliptical coordinates, right? And you can do this in the density, so sigma of theta, which was uh, a model of theta, now you write sigma of this theta that you see here as a function of theta 1 and theta 2. And you have an elliptical mass distribution. Or you can go to the potential phi of theta, uh, which was a modulus, and now write phi of this theta that you get here. And you have an elliptical model in the 
uh, in the potential. Ellipticals models in the potential are very easy to deal with because you just get this derivative of the potential to get the, the, the Jacobian and so on, uh, but are less realistic. And models which have the, the elliptical mass density, they are uh, harder to work out, I mean, numerically, but they are more realistic. Um, okay, so this was for the lens. Uh, I'm just mentioning some very uh, simple examples that can be worked out that are implemented in codes, and you'll see right now. Um, but of course, you can take any, any kind of mass distribution, okay? Uh, now for the source, again, we will consider some kind of analytic model for the source. The source is a distant galaxy, so usually you won't see a lot of features in the source. So we will model the source by a CERSIC profile. By the way, those that, that don't know, CERSIC was astronomer here in this observatory. So every time we, we, we say CERSIC profile was, uh, I forgot his first name now, but anyway. He was an astronomer here. He made a catalog of southern galaxies and tried to fit their, their light distribution and proposed this expression that is now used, very widely used. So the Cersei's expression is what you see there. It's exponential of some power law. And again, you can make it uh, elliptical just by introducing this elliptical coordinate there, R square. So the position of the source, beta 1, beta 2, centered in the position S1, S2. Uh, with an ellipticity epsilon s, we'll have this kind of uh, elliptical coordinates, and then you have your elliptical mass distribution. Um, so if I want to simulate now uh, strong lensing, what I have to do is to write the, 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 the surface brightness, the intensity of light that I, I'm, I'm calling i, the intensity of light as a function of theta in the lens plane. That's what you want, right? But what you know is, uh, is the intensity distribution as a function of beta in the source plane. That's what the CERSIC profile is giving, right? It's the light distribution in the source plane. is a function of beta. But now the, the, the um, lens equation, it's just mapping beta into theta, right? So uh, let's go back to the lens equation. Oops. No. You can take this time to ask questions. Okay, so let's go back to the equation. I'm sorry. Okay, so once, so what's the lens equation is telling you? Once uh, you know theta, you can make this, you can map theta into beta if you know alpha. But you know alpha, it's a deflection angle. You compute it, you have a model for the mass distribution. So I want to, to, to compute the intensity as a function of theta, right? Uh, but I have beta as a function of theta. So I just plug the lens equation into my light distribution. Remember, beta is equal to theta minus alpha of theta. So sorry for the confusion. So I just go here. That's a function of beta, right? But I, I know beta as a function of theta 1 and theta 2, and beta 1 as a function of theta 1 and theta 2 through the lens equation. So I just plug the lens equation here, and I have the image in the right, right? So I start in the left is the source plane, is the Cersic galaxy. And at the end, I obtain uh, images of the, the arts. Uh, in this case, they are arcs, they are two, and, and that's it. You can uh, uh, make this for, uh, for elliptical models, uh, pseudo-elliptic, and you get all these this configurations, like an Einstein ring, uh, multiple images, and, and all sorts of, of solutions. So now there is a code in, um, in the repository that uh, it's a simple code. I mean, it's, it, has, it has just these, uh, these analytical expressions built in, so it's not a, a very large code. It's not this fancy code. It was made by one of our students, Eduardo Valadão, um, uh, uh, undergraduate student. And we have the code here. Martin. Yes. Uh, it's Hannah here. Um, I'm going to add a notebook that people can uh open the fits files after process by uh, pentarchs okay great okay so they, they, they have access later right okay so maybe uh, i'm not showing this yeah. okay so just to, to let you know I, uh, also for some reason i'm not being able to 
Can you see my screen? Yes. I'm not being able to open this. Maybe you need to refresh your browser because uh, after some time, yes. <laughs> okay, I'll go, go back. But okay, so if you go uh, open your binder and you go back to our repository, but it's not even loading. It's not. Uh, okay, so you see a folder named uh, Strong Lensing, and then you see PaintArts v2.0. So these are the set of Python codes that will produce the uh, simulated images that I have shown. You can add to these images a point spread function, the noise, so that it looks like a simulated arc image, sort of realistic. Uh, but so currently, Okay, so here's the, the Python code, but as, as uh, Hannah mentioned, he will add, uh, this will generate some, some uh, FITS files, but he will generate some, uh, make a, um, a notebook where these FITS files will be converted into an image and they will see it uh, live. So uh, otherwise I have to create the FITS file, download and open with a DS9 viewer. So let's keep this one, but uh, when, when you go back to the repository, this will be uh, uh, okay. So let's go back to the presentation. Um, okay. Yes, okay, so at, at, as I was saying, uh, you, you don't need to solve the lens equation. You can use these analytical solutions to generate a lot of, uh, of uh, configurations and they are pretty realistic, uh, at least for many purposes. And you can add uh, noise, PSF, and if you want, you can add this to a real image where you have a galaxy in between, you have other galaxies and so on. That's why we call this paint arcs. You can paint the simulated arts on real images. Okay, so you can play around with it. Um, so, okay, now a more uh, uh, realistic situation that, that you want to do is you have a, a real image of a, a system with, uh, with strong lensing, and now you want to infer properties of the lens from the images, right? So one thing you can do is to look at the peaks of the light distribution in the arc, for example, uh, so in this example, that's a gravitational system that we discovered in the SOAR Gravitational Arts Survey, SOGRAS, for the Brazilians that may be funny. Um, so um, you see that this arc has three peaks, uh, and you can think of as images of the peak of the lens. So you can use these multiple peaks, these coordinates, theta ops, the coordinates of the three peaks. You have a model for the lens. Uh, we, 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 the prediction of the model is the position theta model right, uh, position of the source is beta, and these parameters pi, they are parameters of the lens, can be ellipticity, mass, or anything. So for a given parameters of the lens, for a given source position, you will predict a given number of images in a given number of positions. So what we make is just a chi-square between the positions, for example, the three position of the images, so that's six uh, 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 parameters that you measure, and of course, you can constrain less than six uh, degrees of freedom, uh, but, for example, you can constrain the, the galaxy position, ellipticity, and mass, okay? Uh, so that's one way of doing this, uh, using only the, the, the positions of the multiple images. And that's uh, able to uh, recover some properties of the lens. It's very accurate for measuring, for example, the mass within an Einstein ring, okay? So this is just an example uh, of, uh, of, um, of this using, this fit number one is using the three images you get these quantities, velocity dispersion, etc. Uh, but then the model predicts that there is a fourth image. And you kind of see, uh, after this number four with a quotation mark, uh, you see below there is a, a, a something. So if you think this is the a fourth image predicted by the model, then you can go ahead and use this image to improve the fit. So that, that's uh, used a lot in, the, in this kind of modeling. Which kind of system is this? It's a cluster? It's a... Right, so in this case, it's a, um, the, 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 it's a group, a galaxy group. Mm. So we are making a very rough approximation by using a single mass profile. Uh, probably I will mention later what we do when we have a cluster with a lot of images. Mm. Uh, we have to improve the model. In this case, there's not much we can do. So it's, it's a larger halo because it's a halo where you have uh, where you have other galaxies, that, that group. And another question that I wanted to make before, so uh, 
which is or approximately the smaller smaller smallest distance you can infer of the, the the central mass the mass of this distribution from a strong lensing image uh, in a typical i don't know well resolved or hmm. sorry uh, no, the, the center of the mass distribution no the um, yeah the size the the smallest size you can in, by which you can infer a, a given uh, uh, mass. Okay, you mean a spatial resolution on the recovery of the of the projected density. Yes. Right. In in this way we are uh, doing here, uh, it's we have so few parameters and a very smooth mass distribution. The only thing we can do is to to have the the center of the mass distribution free. So you see here here that the center of the mass distribution has a shift with respect to the galaxy center and that's because of the of the potential where it is right mm. it's a uh, it's in a uh, it's in the potential of the group not the galaxy uh, but but uh, in galaxy clusters where you have a lot of of images mm. then you can resolve scales um, i don't remember by heart now but i can tell you later okay. i think it's uh, a tens of kiloparsecs mm. the resolution that you have mm. Uh, so you may be asking this because of warm dark matter effects or self-interacting dark matter effects. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of controversy in this, and then we can discuss about that later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So these things work very well for the overall mass distribution. Okay. Uh, once you want to know the details of the mass distribution, it's where things get tricky, but we can discuss. Uh, that's a very interesting thing to be discussed. So here's another system uh, that we discovered in the CS82 survey. I like a lot the system because uh, the lens is, is two galaxies, right? Uh, the visual part. We have an almost complete Einstein range. So that tells you already that these two galaxies are sitting in an overall potential that's almost uh, uh, spherical, although you have two very clearly different light distributions. If, if you want to fit this, this uh, system with two masses, like, okay, the mass distribution is two, uh, the fit obliges you to make either one go, the mass goes to zero, or the two are in the, have the same center. So it's really asking for a spherical profile, okay? So I like to call this bullet cluster just in the sense that clearly the mass distribution is not following the light distribution, okay? Uh, so another way of modeling this system, one way is just you look at the peaks, like in the very far right image, you model the peaks positions like you mentioned before. But another way that's more, uh, more informative is to use the whole light distribution of the, the, the image, not just the bright spots, but the whole brightness surface distribution. Uh, on, on one hand, you may have more information because you have uh, multiple brightness peaks and so on, so you're using the whole information. And on the other hand, you may be able to reconstruct the, sh the source, the shape of the source, the size of the source, so it it's, um, uh, may have more constraining power for the mass distribution, and in addition, you get, gain information on the source. So there are codes that do this. Um, the key is to get rid of the contamination of the light of the lens, right? Because you use all the light of the images. So what you do is you fit the light of the lens. So in this case, the lens is two. You have to fit the two light profiles. You subtract them. There is a code that called Gaufit that does that. And so that's the third image from left to right. That's the image with the galaxy lens subtracted, right? And this now will be used for the modeling. And uh, we have a notebook for that, uh, that uh, uh, João França will show us. Um, so just to show you where it is in the repository, oh, now Paint Arts has opened. Um, OK, so João, are you there? Yes, yes, I am. OK, great. So, we, uh, so John prepared two notebooks, one using a code, public code, not by us, uh, named Pi Auto Lens. And there is another code named uh, Lens Astronomy. Uh, I will stop sharing so that uh, John can share. And he will show an example of a notebook built for this Pi Auto Lens code. Are you okay, able to share? Me. Yes, yes, I am. One minute. Can you see my screen? Uh, I see you, but it, it seems that it's loading your screen. Yes, great. Oh, okay. So, um, 
I'm going to show um, two codes, two methods that we use to model uh, a strong lens system, okay? Uh, the first one is the Pyoto Lens, as, as Machin said. This is the official website. And the other is the Lens Astronomy, and this is the, the official website, okay? So um, these two methods work, uh, work in the same way, so they have almost the same structure, okay? So let's, uh, let's begin with the Pyoto Lens, uh, which is the, the easiest one. Um, we begin by um, importing some libraries, okay? So let's, let's run this, this first cell. Uh, here we define um, some useful constants. We have the pixel scale, which gives the, 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 the conversion between the pixel and the arc, the, the arc lens, the, um, which is the, the, the physical uh, unit of the image. We have the exposure time, the exposure time uh, with, uh, which is related to uh, the time that the instrument uh, took to, to observe the, the uh, that image, and we have uh, information about the background that is subtracted from, from the original image. So let's run this, this cell. Um, here is where um, we uh, read the, the image files. Uh, the image files are in the fits format, in the dot fits. So here we read uh, the original. Uh, he, uh, here we also have the, the, the lens light uh, object image that machine show uh, before. We have the residual. Um, I'm going to talk about this later, but uh, we also have the PSF. The PSF in simple words uh, gives information about the blur in the image. So, and this is related also to, to, the, to the instrument. Uh, we have the noisy map, which gives information about the, the noise in each pixel of, of, the, of the image. Of the image. And we also have uh, uh, an imaging uh, object that has all this information, okay? Information about the residual image, about the, the noise in the image and the PSF, okay? So let's run. Um, here we can see um, our, our image. Here we have the original image, okay? Here we have um, the, the lens light. So we are going to subtract from this one later. Um, here we have an example of this, this subtraction. Um, here we can also uh, see uh, the, the PSF, which is a star near for, the, for, the, for this lens system, okay? So let me change um, for the, the residual. Um, this, uh, this image also has uh, some sources of noise so we, um, you, we would like to avoid this, this, this noise information. So we build a mask to only um, to select only the, sy the, uh, the system, okay? So let's apply a mask. It's a circular, a circular mask. And here we apply this mask, okay? So let's apply. We can see uh, the system with the, mat, uh, with the, max, with the mask. So we can uh, see the, the, the arcs uh, more clear uh, in this image, okay? So let's define our model that we want to, to fit, to apply to our data set. So first we set uh, the, the headshift, the lens headshift and the source redshift. Um, we set a, a source galaxy by uh, the, the CESIC profile that Machine said. Uh, we also define a lens galaxy model uh, as a C, uh, CA, which is a, a, a more general approach to the to the CIS, to the spherical uh, model. And again, we have an object that um, have all this all this information. Okay, so let's run it. Uh, here we are going to fit uh, our model. So we set our our method that we are going to use to fit. It's called uh, the dynastic static. It's a little bit uh, um, unimproved for the, for the MCMC that we are already uh, know. Um, but here we define uh, the, the output path. So the name, um, a tag that you want, um, a, a parameter for, for, the, the, for this kind of, of search, 
and the number of cores that you can use for your notebook or laptop for a laptop so uh, here we have an object that has um, uh, information about the data set and the uh, the model okay so let's apply this fit the program will start to to read uh, a previous uh, result okay so let's see um, okay, so at this point, is, uh, I'm going to show you uh, a GIF that illustrates what is, what is happening here, okay? So we have a previous image that is not showing here, and um, here we have uh, what's going on uh, in this software, okay? So uh, it's trying to, to reproduce uh, the image. So let's see, um, at this point, it, it is touching to converge, so... Yeah, we can see that um, here we also have uh, the residual and the key squared maps, and he stopped it, and it's it's uh, yeah, it's already converted. So this is what is happening in the in this um, in this software. Okay, so for the image we have uh, the original image, which is this uh, this one that we see before with, that we saw before, and here we have the model image. We have also the, the PSF. And here we have the key squared map. Um, although we have uh, some higher values in, in some pixels, we can see that our model, uh, we have uh, uh, our model, uh, our Im original image is, is reproduced well. OK, so this is the main idea of the Pyoto lens. Uh, Finally, we, we can see some uh, samples. It can take a while to, to run the cell. Let's wait. Um, we are going to see some uh, samples of for each parameter. So here we have each parameter of this fit, and we have some samples and also uh, confidence curves. Okay. So this is um, this is the main idea of the Pyoto lens. Um, for the lens astronomy one, uh, we have uh, this this other notebook, and as I said before, um, these two methods work in the same way, so they have a similar structure. Um, I, I found out that uh, this notebook can take a while to run, so I'm, I will not run it, but uh, I will just uh, show you some of the, of the steps because it, it's really similar to the to the Pyoto lens. Okay, so uh, at the beginning we start some constants. It's really similar to, to the uh, to the Pyoto lens. We read the image. We plot that image. We set our model uh, again a Cerskic profile and a CMS profile. Um, we set some some useful useful uh, constants that we set before. We set this to to the to the lens astronomy. This is a little bit different from the from the the Pyoto lens. We set some priors. Uh, we have to set some priors for this for this uh, algorithm, this uh, astronomy for, for the astronomy. Um, we fit our model, and here uh, we use as a default an MCMC method. Okay, so at the end we can visualize our our results. Here we can uh, see the effect of, of the PSF. The PSF is convolved with the original image, so we have a blur effect. Okay, this is the uh, the image model, and again we have uh, the samples and the confidence, the confidence curves. Okay, so um, this is the main idea of the of the uh, of modeling a strong lens system. So let me know if you have uh, any question, or you can talk in the in the by email if you want. So. Uh, anyway, that's it, Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, question? I, show, I have a question. Uh, okay. what, uh, which uh, parameters did you fit exactly uh, in, the, in the program? Okay, can, can, you, uh, can you repeat? Which, which parameters did you fit in this example? Okay, we, we fit um, the, theta, the theta Einstein, the, the Einstein angle, um, the, the uh, ellip ellipticities, uh, the center of the lens, okay. The R Cesic, which is a parameter for for the the, the profile, the N Cesic, 
which is also another parameter. We have uh, also the ellipticities uh, of the source and the center of the source. This is the, these are the, the these parameters. Uh, thank you. And now it uh, inspired me another question regarding this, uh, which is, um, the, so you use a Monte Carlo, how much time it, it took to, to make this uh, best fee? Okay, uh, in this, in, the, in, in my local machine, it can take uh, about 15 minutes to run. And in Binder, uh, I think I think it, it's showing um, two hours because I think by then by uh, the, my Binder uh, doesn't work well with uh, multi-core task. So, but yeah, it can take a uh, it can take about fifteen minutes to run ah, okay. one system. Another question. So, the, uh, in this example, uh, did you consider your system? Uh, you do you need to consider any data distribution for some free parameter related to that or not for the for the lens? Okay, Martin, can you repeat? Yes, I, it's exactly. too low. The, you, you had to assume some dark matter distribution to fit. Uh, yeah, so actually he's fitting the whole mass distribution. Yes, and the that's the mass free, distribution. That's a free but, parameter. Ah, but he used searching for that. Searching is for the source. Ah, okay. Is the light profile? Yeah. The CSIC is the light profile. And what's the lens model you use? Uh, see, uh, see it. I see it. Uh, so a model. single isothermal ellipsoid. Yeah. Ah, okay. It has a single isothermal profile and some ellipticity. Uh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that, that's the point that typically it would be very difficult to disentangle the variance to the dark. They're not very case because uh, so what you could sense, do in the sense to try to test something about the matter right? yes what you could do to disentangle both yes. is uh, you assume you have a, some mass to light ratio and from the light profile you build a mass profile of the mass of the baryonic mass right um, so so that then you have one free parameter mass to light ratio but the shape of the mass distribution contributed by the baryons is given by the light. And then you sum this to some dark matter profile, and then you can disentangle in that way. Yeah, probably you have some degeneracy, but that's the way you, you do it. Um, yeah, and so the final question to this is, I guess not, but is enough the sensitivity in the image in order to distinguish well, a fixed mass to light ratio, let's say, that is known for that system you are studying, it, uh, is another sensitivity to, 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 to disentangle a uh, behavior which is cast to occur in this dark matter file? Or, so. Okay, in, uh, we didn't try with our images, uh, but that's a lot of studies, not using ground based data like we did, but using HST data uh, to try to measure the, the, the slope in the core. There's mm. a, uh, I know some quite old papers from the slacks uh, by Koopman et al, uh, Tommaso Otreo et al, but for sure they are newer things. But what they do is exactly try to get the inner slope. And I think it was consistent at that time with uh, R to the minus one, like in its day. Mm. Okay. But, but yes, uh, with these images, ours, uh, in this example, which is a uh, ground-based image, you have less information, but with space-based you have more. Are there other questions? So, uh, thank you, João. Thank and you. as I said, uh, we, we sort of cheated for the Pyoto lens because we used some pre run, you know, and CMC. Uh, but of course, you can do it yourself. If you have a multi core machine, uh, things can be fast. But with, uh, with the binder, it's uh, at least, uh, yeah, it took about two hours for uh, lens astronomy. But you can, you can run at home, uh, have fun. Okay, so let me continue. I'll share again my stream. Are there any other questions? Okay, so uh, when you do this kind of modeling, um, there are some quantities that are very well measured, uh, and some not so well, and that's something that uh, João is studying. But one of the things you measure uh, very robustly is the Einstein ring, 
which is this mass contained within the Einstein radius, probably. Um, so let's see some, some applications of, of this kind of analysis, right? So, uh, so for, for galaxy scale lenses, for this kind of reconstruction, what, what, what things you can uh, strike? So I will mention just three examples, and we may go through one of them in more detail. So one example is looking for substructure in the lens. Uh, when you make this kind of fitting and you may find that uh, the fit is not good for a single mass, but if you put like a blob of a substructure, you may find like a, a substructure in the lens. So in this case, uh, a substructure, what, if the substructure is close to the Einstein ring, even if the mass is very small, it may have a big impact. So that's one uh, thing that's important in lensing because of the caustic structure. The caustic structure is very sensitive to the presence of substructure close to the caustic, okay? And this can cause magnifications, distortions. So uh, uh, it's like the caustic is, a, is a, um, a formerly a divergence, and it's very sensitive to substructure. And that's one of the key things and one of the, the important potentials of strong lensing is being able to, to sense this substructure that could be around uh, sorry, the, the critical curves, okay? So the, this, this uh, structure that can be around close to the, in the line of sight, close to the lens. So this example, they found pretty small sub-clump of mass 10 to the 8. Uh, that, that was a nature paper. It was like a first in that time. Uh, but, but this is, uh, has a lot of potential. If we have a, a many systems with Einstein rings with space-based resolution, uh, we can be very sensitive uh, to sub-structure um, uh, and we know that substructure is very sensitive to the nature of dark matter. Uh, I think like, like uh, um, Carlos was asking, if you have warm dark matter, then you have like a minimum size of the clumps. Uh, depends, of course, on the mass. So you could, in, in this estimate that I'm quoting here from a paper, uh, if you have about 100 uh, systems like this, you can uh, uh, go below uh, masses 10 to the 7 solar masses, which is important to, to, to test one of the war dark matter scenarios of a sterile neutrino of, of seven k okay so that's just just to mention an example let's work a little bit uh, in more detail another example for testing gravity so i mentioned yesterday that the the, the line element the metric for, for example where light propagates can be written as as two potentials in the general case in in general relativity these two potentials will be the same uh, but if we, in some modifications of general relativity they are different, so we, we call slip parameter or a post-Newtonian parameter the ratio between these two. So in GR, they are one. Uh, um, if we find one, we are not proving GR because some other modified gravity also have one. But if we prove that gamma is different from one, then GR is essentially ruled out. So testing the value of gamma is very important. And if we go to the, 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 the from this matrix, we, we work out the geodesic, so the motion of massive bodies like CDM, okay, non-relativistic bodies, we see that the motion uh, it's sensitive only to the to one potential, the G00, the phi, right? Whereas the photons, the new geodesics, they are sensitive to the sum of the potentials. So combining information from the, the motion of massive particles, so for example, the dynamics of stars in a galaxy, right? Combining this information with the light propagation around the galaxy maybe a way of disentangled and, and, and finding the difference between phi and psi, right? So the, 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 the motion of the stars in the galaxy is given by the Jeans equation, and uh, uh, of course the light deflection by the lensing. So by combining the kinematics of the lens with the, the lensing, we are, we are able to set constraints on this gamma, right? And just to have a pictorial understanding of why this is so, um, so in, in the Jeans equation is like intuitive because in, 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 uh, in Newtonian uh, gravity, we just have one potential anyway. Uh, but in the case of uh, propagation of light, uh, we saw yesterday uh, from this line uh, element how to get uh, some uh, refraction index. And now we can generalize this to when you have two uh, potentials, phi and psi, and we again make a null geodesic, so ds squared equals zero. And then we find a connection between the distance, sigma, and the time dt, like a effective uh, uh, speed of, of uh, light propagation. And when we real linearize this for weak fields, uh, we have what's making the role of, of, of uh, uh, 2 phi is phi plus psi. So it's clear that sensitivity to the sum of the potentials. So we, we may write 
uh, psi by just right, uh, right, uh, um, using that psi over or phi over psi is gamma. So we can just uh, write everything in terms of, of phi. And then we, we may write our problem as a function of gamma, where we are assuming gamma equal constant here, just uh, uh, for the sake of simplicity, right? OK. So dynamical mass is from the Poisson equation, and this gives you our Jeans equation and uh, the lensing. So just have a basic picture here. Uh, we assume we have a single isothermal profile, right? This will give you uh, some uh, velocity dispersion. But we have two velocity dispersions now. One velocity dispersion, that's the parameter that you derive from the lensing and which is sensitive to, to potentials. And you have the velocity dispersion that you measure from the stars that will give you like the same profile, but now it's uh, for only one potential. So there is a difference of one plus gamma over two between these two velocity dispersions, right? So the velocity dispersion that you measure in the lens uh, through the modeling of the lensing would be compared to the velocity dispersion that you measure from the stars, uh, but the, the relation between the two is one plus gamma over two. So you could make a table of these velocities and, and measure gamma, okay? That's like a very um, uh, toy modelish uh, way of, of looking at the problem just to understand what's going on. But in general, you use more complex models like non singular isothermal. Um, you consider that the, the, um, you may have a velocity anisotropy, so the radio and the tangential velocity dispersions are not the same. Uh, you have to take into account a lot of observational uh, uh, factors when you compare the, the, observa the, the measured velocity dispersion because you measure this as a spread of a line within some given aperture. So you are combining things from the center to the outskirts of the lens. So there are a lot of things that you have to take into account, but this is done. Uh, let me skip the details, but this is the Jeans equation, and you take into account this an anisotropy of velocity dispersion. Uh, and at the end, you have a way of connecting theta Einstein. If you look at this equation, 20 here, theta Einstein appears there uh, in the right-hand side with the observed velocity dispersion. And there is uh, the models of everything. So when you do this, and this has been done since the 2007 or 9, the first papers, and until nowadays. Uh, again, you take into account the light profile, uh, for example, power law, mass density profile, uh, velocity and isotropy, you, and you, you run this for uh, systems where you have a measured uh, velocity dispersion and you have a modeled uh, um, mass distribution from the lensing, and you can infer uh, the parameters there, and in particular, gamma. Right, and that's the result, right? So you find a gamma uh, in, in all these studies uh, that's very close to one. Okay, so it's compatible with general relativity, and that, this is uh, also something that's easy to code. I don't know if it's working in the repository now, uh, but Henan can tell us. Yeah, sure. Um, I can. I can share my screen. Okay, so let me stop sharing, but I lost my mouse. So Henan Alves will show an example of a notebook that does this kind of analysis. Let me just in here. Um, hi, everyone. Um, OK, let me share my screen. Sure. Uh, OK, uh, I think before I start sharing my screen, I will uh, let me Okay, uh, I, th I think you are uh, able to see my screen now. Great, so why don't you share your screen? We, we just take a question here. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe a bit speculative, but um, so could it be this method used to <clears throat> test mo <clears throat> Mondial-like theories? Because it is maybe interesting that the fact that you are testing distances in which the, the mon theories or mon like theories claim to be a, a distances above which uh, you know the the standard Newtonian dynamics should change or or even the Tevez relativistic theories could could, could could change. Maybe this this technique may be uh, applied to to try to let's say I don't know if rule out but exclude or, or constrain the, 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 the hypothesis of mon. Yeah, you, you could you can work out these equations in uh, like in Tevez and uh, tensor vector scalar theories. Yeah. 
and, and see and see what goes. Yes, yeah, so one thing that one student uh, is doing, in, instead of considering a gamma equal constant, uh, it's really taking a, a, a complete f of r theory. And so the, the genes equation gets a bit modified, the light propagation gets a bit modified, everything gets a bit modified. You can, you can do this like in, in the Hondaisky theory, more general setting. So you know how the equations change. And so in principle, once you give a model, uh, you, you can test this model. I don't know if there will be degeneracies. What uh, this student, uh, Fernanda, is, is doing is exactly to check whether we can measure the parameter, whether the degeneracies the, the allow you to really test these more realistic or general uh, modified gravity models. In principle, you could do this with Tevez. I, I, I don't know if you can write Tevez as a, no, you cannot, right? Because on that case, a general um, tensor scalar, but not vector, right? But I mean, you can do it. Just, just write the motion of a massive and massless geodesics with all takes two, and you can do this test in principle. With I think model. people should, should try this test, right? Yes. Because they're... Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we are doing with F of R, then, then we can go to Tevez. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, uh, and now we are seeing you. But okay, not... uh, okay, yeah, let me reshare again. Okay, so I think you can see my screen now. Um, so if you if you open the link at the, uh, my binder uh, and I add a very naive notebook on how to open the fits file generated by Pentarx, uh, it's here. So if you go to this is a tree and then you go to uh, strong lensing Pentarx and then there is this check output. So here is very naive. You can open and see uh, whatever fits file um, Pentarx gives to you. But uh, you also can check, you also can see the images here uh, using this software here, it's called Trilogy. Uh, it's on GitHub, I can show later. And then you can create uh, RGB, fake, fake RGB images. Uh, here is the cosmic versus hole. And then you can create whatever uh, RGB uh, image you, you like, if you, if you want. Uh, so this is nice. Uh, and uh, I will add this later on the repository. Okay, so, um, if you go to the tree, there is uh, this folder here uh, at um, strong lensing is uh, rings to Cosmo. Oh, if you have any questions, please uh, inter interrupt me. Um, so in this uh, rings to Cosmo here, uh, I add a notebook here. And um, here uh, you, we use data from uh, this paper. Uh, we uh, basically they have uh, 80 uh, strong lensing selected systems with uh, many uh, lensing features, for example, the right shift of lens of the source, and then the velocity dispersions and some uh, uh, Einstein ring measured. And uh, we're going to use this data here. Uh, but because uh, later we do uh, some uh, MCMC, and then unfortunately my binder, I think he used only two cores. This might take longer. So I, I opened this in another notebook here. I, if you want to have an estimate, you take, uh, more than 20 minutes to do the sampling. Um, so that's why I'm going to use another notebook here. Okay, so uh, to, to make the test that Martin mentioned before, uh, so first we load the data, and then uh, again, we use from this paper. There are 80 uh, strong lens systems, and then we extract uh, the redshift of the lens, the redshift of the source, uh, the, this, um, the size of the Einstein ring, uh, the size of the aperture measured by the spectroscope for uh, what, uh, each instrument they used in, in this paper, uh, the scene, and then they uh, measured the velocity dispersions, right? So here uh, in this uh, ring to Cosmo, there are three ways to calculate uh, uh, three quantities. Uh, for, for, for this example here, we are trying to measure the, the power law density profile indexes, uh, which you call alpha. Uh, the total mass density profile, which is uh, delta, and uh, um, and the the, the gamma uh, ppn, which is supposed to be one, right? So if you if you calculate if you only uh, do a minimization of the log likelihood without assuming any priors, um, of course you have to assume uh, some initial conditions here. Uh, we ended up with uh, gamma equals to 0 0.7, which is very, uh, it, it's not so close to uh, general relativity because we expect this quantity here to be close to one. 
Right, but what if we add some priors uh, to the uh, log likelihood and then we minimize? Uh, we get a better result, which uh, is very close to one. This is, uh, these two quantities here are supposed to be uh, as is. Uh, this is, is supposed to be equal to uh, uh, two. And then this is supposed to be, I think, uh, uh, 0.2, I believe. Uh, but uh, we are interested in the gamma, which is uh, if, if, if you have general relativity, it's supposed to be uh, one, right? But there is another way to do this. Um, which you can use uh, Monte Carlo. And uh, here we use an EMC to do the sampling. So we, we throw several points here to the parameter space, and then we calculate the, all these quantities here for each of the system, right? And here I'm using a 10, um, a 10 cores, and uh, this take uh, about three minutes. So if you have more cores, this will be faster. But no, please note that uh, this is only for um, for 80 systems. So if you increase the number of systems, you probably increase a little bit of uh, uh, the timing uh, to calculate this, this rate. OK, this is um, some uh, MCMC step. I'm not showing this. OK, so this, these are the corner plot. Uh, can you see my screen, like uh, uh, the numbers here clearly? Or do I have to make a zoom? We see the corner plots. I can see. I can see. OK, so here, as you can see, uh, the gamma is very close to 1, is 0.997. Uh, which is very consistent to the uh, the paper, uh, the, the original paper here. And then another way to show this data here, right? Uh, so uh, you can you can play with this code here, and you can try to model um, if this eighty uh, strong lines and systems. Do you want to add anything else, Martin? No, it's great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Questions. I will share again my screen. Right. Are there any questions to Renan about this? Okay. So, okay, so that's an example of an application. Once you model a system, you measure from lensing some properties, and uh, you can compare this, uh, in this case, uh, with velocity dispersion to measure the uh, possible modification of the general relativity. I was going to show another example of a large cluster where you can, uh, um, when you can measure, for example, the dark energy equation of state. Uh, but I, I think we should make a break now, go to weak lensing. And then if we have time, I can go back to that. Uh, but just to tell you that when you have clusters, you have a lot of sources at different redshifts. And then you may be sensitive to different distances. And then because of that, since the distance uh, a redshift relation is sensitive to the dark energy, you are able not only to recover the distribution of matter, but also to recover, uh, uh, for example, dark energy equation of state. But uh, let's keep this at least for now. And let's make a break. I think it's already tough. Uh, so let's make a 10-minute break. Or uh, what do you think? Yesterday, I think the break was too, sh too short. Let's make a 10-minute break. So in Argentina, it's 10 to 4. So we'll be back at 4, OK? And then we start with weak lensing. And of course, if you have questions, I, I will be here for this 10-minute break if you have questions. But feel free to leave.
हेलो आई थिंक देयर इज अ ब्रेक नाउ आई हैव वन क्वेश्चन Okay, I see there is a question by Manas Awasati. Sorry, I'm I'm not know if I'm pronouncing correctly your name. We study a different uh, uh, models of the dark matter. Sorry, I hear you very very uh, light. Could you speak louder, please? we study different types of uh, models the different models of the dark matter through the gravitational lensing so how we really do that yeah i'm i'm sorry i'm i'm i cannot hear you could you just try to shout a little bit okay wait could you say it again or type it we study uh, we study a different we have uh, yeah i'm sorry i really seems to be a, a sound problem I, i i i just barely can understand that you are talking but i cannot hear Now, or if, if you could type the question can you hear my voice in the can chat you, or on the you, discord can you hear my voice now i can i can hear your voice okay 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 yeah me too so my my question was that that we uh, uh we made different models of the dark matter in the galaxy clusters uh, through the uh gravitational lensing by using the applications and all so how we really do that okay so how we could do how we could test models of dark matter in galaxy clusters with lensing yes yes yeah so um de- it depends of course on the dark matter model but some like self interacting dark matter uh it's it may produce a shift uh between the dark matter and the um um let's see okay so self interacting dark matter may have two effects one is to decrease the clustering small scales uh, but also um uh, if you have for example uh, uh galaxies uh, they will follow the same geodesics as dark matter right uh, whereas self interacting dark matter may have shifts uh, between uh, the dark matter and the light positions so that's something that you may try to look also with lensing uh, you 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 may have free positions of subclumps for the dark matter for example so these are two effects that can be probed 
uh, once you reconstruct the mass distribution and you compare with the light distribution. Um, for example, typically if you have a, a system that has a collision, like in the bullet cluster, you have a segregation between the, the galaxies and the gas, and the galaxies and the dark matter would follow the same and the gas not. If you have a collision with uh, self-interacting dark matter, then not only the gas will have a shift, but the, dark, the galaxies and the dark matter will also have a shift because of the self-interaction. So that's something that you can probe uh, even in the scale of two galaxies that have merged or in, 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 in clusters. Um, so that's something people look at, and that there are maybe a 10 of clusters where there are constraints on the cross-section of self-interacting dark matter because of this. Uh, I, I'm, I don't know very recent results, but up, up to recently there were like a controversy. So some, sta some studies uh, obtained a, a, a lower bound for the, 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 um, the cross-section. So they detected a self-interacting cross-section and other people set an upper bound. So consistent with no self-interaction. So uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure this is uh, super um, uh, uh, established in the community. Um, there were studies, um, more detailed studies of the collisions of the system showing that you could have shifts, uh, but not due to the dark matter of interaction. So, I mean, it's something that you can definitely test uh, with this kind of, of data, especially in clusters, but I'm not sure it is conclusive or, or consensual yet. Um, regarding warm dark matter, it's the same uh, discussion about substructures. Um, you can uh, uh, probe the clumpiness of clusters, say, um, either by adding a lot of blobs or by making analyses that are, are not um, parametric. So you try to reconstruct the mass distribution with no a, a priori models, right? Making like a grid of, of mass. And in both ways, you can test the substructures. Um, right now, you are sort of on the verge to be sensitive to the most uh, um, uh, uh, warm dark matter models, the most popular warm dark matter models. So I think it's just a matter of uh, improving the precision um, of the data and the models. Uh, but right now, again, there was still a controversy between some studies that found an excess of substructures and there were some studies that find a lack of substructures. So I'm not sure this is conclusive yet, but again, that's something um, that should improve uh, uh, in a short time span. Okay, thank okay, you. Thanks for the questions. Are there other questions? Okay. I have one more question. Is yes. it uh, is it possible to detect dark matter? Means why we haven't detected yet uh, after so many after so many tries and Sorry. many kind of discoveries. It's many now, experiments. Now, it's, now the sound it's it's better. At the beginning I couldn't hear. Could you repeat, please? Yeah, I'm saying that can we, why we haven't detected dark matter? I means is it really possible to detect the particles that made, uh, that made dark matter? Yes, yeah, sorry. Could you, could you replace, uh, repeat or type? Yeah, um, I'm asking that uh, can we really detect the particles that made dark matter? Okay, can we really detect the particle that made dark matter? Yeah, so that's so a question. Is it? Is it the question? Yes, yes. OK. So that's a question that is being tried to be addressed in many experiments, like particle detection experiments, where you, you, you assume that the dark matter may have some interaction besides gravity. It can be the weak interaction of the standard model of, uh, of uh, particle interactions. It could be new uh, interactions. Uh, but that's a lot of effort trying to measure the particle of dark matter as a particle. So transferring energy to something on the standard model that you can measure in the laboratory. So, so far there, were, there are no conclusive uh, results, positive results. Uh, a very, very large range of masses is being probed by these experiments, very different experiments uh, testing different mass ranges, different natures of the dark matter. So uh, in principle, yes, uh, that's what people are, are, are looking for. Uh, but uh, I mean, if dark matter has some interaction, uh, but there is no, so far no, uh, no result, no positive result. But that's a very active field of research. 
Okay, I will try to share my screen. So that we go to the wiki landing part now. I don't think we have much time, so but let's let's look at least one example. So can you Okay. So let's go to the weak lensing and as we saw yesterday uh, um, if the, the lens mass is not strong enough so that uh, there are uh, uh, POSIGs and critical curves, or, or if you are not uh, sufficiently aligned between the, the source, the lens, and the observed, um, you will not generate a strong effect like multiple images or arcs, but still there would be distortions, smaller, tiny distortions of the background galaxies, and this is known as the weak lensing. They are small, such that you cannot notice this effect in a single galaxy, but as we, set, we shall see, that uh, it's possible to detect statistically. Um, so we can skip this that you already saw yesterday, just to remind you that the uh, effect of the mapping, and in this case, you can look at the local mapping of the, 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 the source, because it's a linear mapping, it's a really a weak effect. Um, so we, we can look at the local distortions, and as we saw yesterday, uh, one of the, if the source is a circle, the image uh, in the linear mapping will be an ellipse. And uh, the axis of these ellipses uh, will be given by the eigenvalues of the Jacobian uh, matrix. So if you measure uh, the, the, the variation in the size, which is exactly the, ma the, the magnification, it will be given by this expression. And if you measure the ratio of the axis, you can uh, assign an ellipticity, and this ellipticity for a circular source will just be given by gamma over one minus kappa, okay? So if I take perfect circular galaxies in the universe, then you measure ellipticities, and then you measure weak lensing. But of course, the galaxies are not perfectly circular, so they have an intrinsic ellipticity, and, uh, and, and one of the difficulties is uh, how you measure the weak lensing, uh, if you don't know what's the intrinsic ellipticity of the galaxy without the lensing, right? Um, so th this quantity that that is um, that gives you the ellipticity induced by the lensing, right? It's gamma uh, over one minus kappa. We call this g reduced shear. And if the, the we are reading the weak lensing regime, this means that kappa and gamma are both much smaller than one. So basically, you can think that the reduced shear or the ellipticity induced by weak lensing is just gamma, okay? So gamma is what will uh, both stretch but also twist your image, okay? All right, so one of the things is that uh, galaxies are not circle. Galaxies are just a surface brightness distribution of something. Uh, so we have to, to, to really see what's the effect on lensing on a surface bright distribution, not on a, on a, on a circle. Um, from a brightness distribution, which we call I of theta, we can determine a center, like the center of mass. Uh, and you can measure the second momenta with respect to this center. And this, this, this matrix gives you an idea of how the light is distributed, right? And from this uh, uh, second momenta, you can measure the area. And also, you can measure ellipticity and orientation. So this, you can compute this for any kind of light distribution, regardless of the shape. So you, you may define ellipticity, and it's useful to work in, uh, in um, uh, complex uh, coordinates uh, so that uh, the, the angle is, is connected to the, to the inclination angle, right? Um, so here's the second order momenta. In principle, you can compute this. If you, if you have a pixelized light distribution, you just use the pixels to compute this. And you can show that the map, the linear mapping between the Intrinsic ellipticity, which is this epsilon i in the bottom. So intrinsic ellipticity written, uh, written as a magnitude and an orientation, a complex number. Uh, G is the reduced shear. As you see in the right, you can also write it as a complex number. These are two components. Uh, so the, 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 um, the ellipticity uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the source uh, will be the, the um, so, okay, I'm a bit confused here. It's 
uh, let me check just just a moment about my connection. Okay. Yeah. So the EI is the observed ellipticity. I'm sorry. Okay. So EI is the epsilon I is the observed, and epsilon S is the intrinsic, the ellipticity of the source. So these two ellipticities are connected by this expression there. Uh, so when the um, uh, we are reading the weak lensing regime, when kappa is much smaller than one, then this is just uh, the ellipticity of the source is the ellipticity of the image minus g. Okay, so good. We have a connection between ellipticities that we can make for any kind of light distribution, um, and 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 in the in the, <clears throat> in the linearized uh, case, as I so told before. The ellipticity of the image is just the ellipticity of the source plus this shear. Okay, so uh, the, the problem is that uh, we have uh, uh, galaxies that they have intrinsic ellipticity. So how can you measure uh, this, this this ellipticity? This uh, uh, ellipticity induced by the the shear, right? The ellipticity of the image. Uh, you assume that galaxies are randomly distributed. Okay, uh, randomly oriented, right? So that if I take the mean of a sufficiently large number of galaxies, then this mean orientation uh, will be given by uh, the shear. Okay, so that's that's what we call the weak lensing fundamental theorem. So the average ellipticity. So here is taking into account direction and 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 uh, or, and, and uh, direction and, um, and, and what we call intensity magnification. Modulus. Okay, so we take into account uh, the distribution of ellipticities, and in the mean they should be randomly oriented. So that means the, in the mean the intrinsic, the epsilon s, should be zero. So when I make the, the average on the observed ellipticity, I should get the shear. That's the way you do it. Okay, so the, 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 that's the, the key. But the problem is that uh, the value of, of uh, the, the shear it's much smaller than intrinsic ellipticity. So when the noise of on this data, so the, the, the uncertainty in the average will be large. So that's the problem, right? Uh, you have uh, some statistical quantity. You know that the average is G, but you have the uncertainty in the average, which normally is larger than that. So that's, that's the, the, the one of the difficulties, OK? Another difficulty is the observational effects. So if you have a galaxy like the one in the left, and uh, it's sheared like the first uh, image. Of course, this is largely exaggerated. The effect of the shear is much less than what you see, but just for uh, visual purposes, right? Uh, if you would measure this perfect image, your life would be easier. But then you have the atmosphere that blurs the image, but not only blurs, well, the atmosphere blurs, but you have the, the, the telescope. Uh, uh, focus is not perfect. Uh, it may have aberrations and many effects, which means that the, the image of a point is a whole light distribution, which is called point spread function, which is not circular. So you have ellipticities that may be present by the instrument. And also you have uh, uh, the discretization effect because you're measuring pixels. And you have the noise because, um, of course, you are counting uh, photons by, by the electrons that get uh, uh, excited in the pixels. Uh, but this is a, there is an uh, intrinsic uh, Poisson noise because of that photon counting. Also, there are lots of other sources of noise, thermal noise, and so on. So you have a noisy, pixelated, blurred, and distorted image of the galaxies. Uh, the fact that you are able to measure the, galaxy, the, the shapes with extremely high precision, despite of this, for me, is absolutely amazing. I, 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 it's fantastic. It's the power of statistics and, and a lot of things, and of course, bright uh, minds that address this problem. So one thing. Uh, when I started doing cosmology, I hated stars because you know stars were just in between us and the galaxies, and I hated our galaxy. But when we start doing weak lensing, then we see the stars are very useful because stars are point sources, right? So if they show up in my camera with any ellipticity or size, I know that this is the effect of everything I want to get rid of. So for weak lensing, you want to measure the stars. Uh, so an example in the left is exaggerated ellipticities of stars, OK? So you see that your field is distorted, right? But you may correct for that. And that's the right image in the bottom. So I get my, my stars, identify what are the stars, measure the sizes, you understand what are the distortions, you apply the distortion back to the galaxies, and now you are able to measure what are your ellipticities, OK? 
so this is like a typical uh, uh, um, astronomical image. Uh, this is like a typical star we want to, 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 to consider, non-saturated, not too faint. So there's a range of properties that you want to be sure it's a star. And that's a typical galaxy you want to measure cosmic shear. You want to go to far, uh, far away uh, galaxies. So this is very challenging, but in the past 20, 10 years, there has been a lot of, of effort uh, on one way to improve uh, the measurements and, other, and in, the, in the other way to understand what are the systematics. So let's go back, uh, back again to the problem of the, of the noise. Um, so uh, the signal is the mean of the ellipticities of a set of galaxies. But as I was mentioned before, uh, the, you have the, the uncertainty in this mean. And this uncertainty in the mean, in the mean is the root mean squared uh, uh, value in, uh, for, each, uh, for each galaxy, the root mean squared value of the intrinsic ellipticity. So this is large, maybe like 0.3, right? Uh, whereas gamma can be very small. So in the scale of, uh, of uh, galaxy clusters, for example, this gamma is of the order of 0.03. For a galaxy, galaxy lensing, 0.003. Uh, and for cosmic shear, it's 10 to the minus two, uh, minus three. So of a, for an individual measurement, uh, the signal to noise is very small. So to get the signal to noise one, you have to measure really a lot of these galaxies so that the uncertainty in the mean gets uh, 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 proportionally small, right? So uh, you, you need to have hundreds of, uh, well, let's say thousands uh, of uh, measurements uh, to measure the shear on a, uh, on a single galaxy, right? Okay. Uh, so there are basically two regimes uh, for uh, two different methods to address uh, the analysis of the weak lensing data. I mean, the, the, the first thing you have to do is to measure the shears, to measure the ellipticities, and you have to go through this method, well, this thing, I describe it pictorially, about understanding the, the stars, measuring the galaxies, applying the corrections, and so on. Uh, and once you do that, you have a measurement of the uh, ellipticities. Now, from these ellipticities to what the physical quantities you want, you want to measure, they're basically you can divide between two regimes, uh, lensing by galaxies and clusters, where you have a center of reference, and, and you, you can measure uh, with respect to that center what happens. Okay, And you can, for example, try to um, uh, fit the profiles, density profiles of these objects, like galaxies and clusters. And you can do this in a uh, object by object basis. But of course, I told you that to measure one single value of a shear, you have you need thousands of gal background galaxies, right? So you can do this for a massive cluster and a you know a, a very deep image. But in general, you cannot do this for individual objects. What you can do is you combine this information for many galaxies or for many lenses so that effectively you have a much higher density of background galaxies. Uh, I'll mention how we do this. It's called stacking. Uh, on the large scale structure, uh, it's a different kind of analysis that you would do. You, you have these measurements of ellipticities, uh, but you don't have a, a center. What you do is you measure correlations between these uh, ellipticities. So you, you measure power spectrum, correlation functions of the ellipticities, uh, and so the techniques are, uh, are a bit different. But you can, of course, uh, compare then these large-scale uh, structure lensing correlations with, with, with what you predict with models, right? And OK, now I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get to there. But let's, let's think about now and galaxies and clusters. So I have a center. I can uh, uh, decompose the, the direction of orientation in some uh, tangential uh, direction, either stretching this way or this way, like a, a, a radio, and a, a twisted 24, 20, uh, 45 degrees component, right? So I have what we call the, the tangential component of the shear, and we call what we call the cross component of the shear. Okay, so we will divide the, uh, the, the shear in this, these two components, which are, are uh, computed with respect to a given center, okay, that we choose the center of the galaxy, for example. And so it's possible to show that, because what we, what we measure is ellipticities which are connected in the mean by the shear. But what, what we are really interested in is in the mass distribution, which is connected to the convergence. So still you have to do something there. Uh, and, and it's possible to show that the average of the tangential shear on a circle is just the average of the, 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 the conversion within a disk minus the average in the circle, 
okay? So that's, that's the expression that's shown there. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to the calculation, but the mean of the tangential shear along a circle is the mean of the conversion within the disk minus the mean in the circle, okay? And these two quantities, kappa uh, 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 bar and, and kappa mean, once you have a model of the mass distribution, are very easy to be computed, okay? Um, and, and so the, the right-hand side is what you want to measure, and you know this mean is just the mean of the ellipticities in this tangential direction, right? So you decompose your background galaxies in annuli, and you make a mean of the shears in each, in each annulus, okay? Um, now, this is for one system, but you would like to com combine a lot of data to have an effective number of background galaxies, which is much higher, so that the uncertainty gets lower, proportionally, lo uh, proportionally uh, lower. So you want to combine different uh, uh, systems. Uh, however, if they are at different redshifts, uh, kappa is not really mass, it's mass weighted by these cosmological distances, right? But I want to measure the mass, so I really want to convert this to a mass, so to, com to, com to, to combine different data on different galaxies, I want first to, com com to convert my kappa to a surface density, and to do this I just multiply by the critical surface density, so I get something that is uh, 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 a mass density, okay? And so, uh, at the end, the critical mass density, surface mass density, times the mean of the tangential shear is equal to this, um, what we call surface density contrast, which is again a mean within a disk minus the mean in a circle. And this delta sigma, it's trivial to compute for the models, and in the left side, you just uh, get the mean of what are your measured uh, ellipticities, okay? So that's it. Uh, shapes uh, from the redshifts of the lens and the source, you compute the sigma critical. You may either use uh, spectroscopic redshift or photometric redshift. That's another degree of complication that is taken into account. And in principle, you can test your model for the density profile. So this is an example, quite old, uh, the data 2001. I did this 10 years ago, but it, the, the error bars uh, these, these points are these means of the shear in each of these radial beams, and the error bars are just, in that case, very simply computed RMS. But now you, would, uh, you can use more uh, better methods. And then you, you can fit this by the delta sigma provided by your model. In this case, it was a Navarro Frank White model. Okay? Um, so that, this was, a, 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 you know, you see large error bars, was a rough analysis, was combining about 40 galaxy clusters. Uh, so, nowadays, uh, this is like, a, 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 how we say, like, a, in Portuguese we say arroz com feijão, like uh, black beans and, and, and rice is like your everyday food. So, these uh, people do this every time now on, 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 uh, on surveys to, be, to have a measurement of the mass. But since your data has improved, uh, you have to be a bit more careful. So, you take into account the central mass distribution, the, the cluster or the, 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 um, or the galaxy which is often a Navarro Frank white model, but also because you are looking at things that are uh, away from the galaxy, you have um, uh, also the influence of large-scale structure of the universe that you have to account for. And in the mean, this, this can be accounted for using the so-called halo model. I will not go into the details. You saw something about this in Mariana Penalima presentation yesterday, I think. But basically, you take into account the large-scale structure of the universe, contribution to this mean stacked shear, okay? And you can do this if you know the power spectrum of the mass distribution, and if you have a halo model, a mass function, and all, all this gets built in, and you have what's called the two halo term, okay? And sometimes uh, you are using a galaxy cluster, and the center of the galaxy cluster is shifted with respect to the true mass distribution. You can account for that, that's called an offset term, um, and also maybe the, the, the central galaxy, the brightest cluster galaxy, can be massive enough so as to in, in, impact your measurement very close to the center, and you account for that too. So you can take into account several uh, effects uh, on, on fitting these profiles. Mm, and that's one example of, uh, that's, you know, as, as you saw yesterday, the, the mass function is a very sensitive probe of cosmology. 
And the mass function means counting the number of, of clusters as a function of their mass. How you get the mass? One way of, of calibrating the mass is by doing the weak lensing. So what you do, you measure the richness of the clusters, so roughly the number of galaxies in a cluster, and you stack all the data, the weak lensing data, for clusters in a given richness bin. Okay, so you can do, in this case, uh, there is a richness bin of um, uh, lambda, and you look at the, uh, the three plots below. Um, so lambda between 20 and 30, between 30 and 200, and uh, now I can, I can I think the other beans are in, in stellar mass. But anyway, so you, you bin this, right. Um, yes, because this was from a work that's comparing uh, stellar mass, indi mass indicator with the richness indicator. So look at the plots in the right. There are two beans of something where, where I choose to bin the, 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 the clusters. One in top is stellar mass and below, if I remember well, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, the richness and for each, you combine all the, 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 um, the source galaxies behind these clusters that you stack, and you get this signal that you see the, the point with error bars. And now the, 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 the black curve is the total uh, profile that you are fitting, and, and you see like in red is the central galaxy, uh, the, the, the miscentering term is the blue one, and you have the one halo term, which is the main component, uh, is the, the green one, and you have this two halo term that starts being important in large distances, that's where large scale structure uh, begins to be important, right? So if you neglect all these components, you get a biased measure of the mass, because you fit this data anyway, not such a good fit, but you get a mass, and this mass can be different. So that's one example of um, uh, improvements that you have to do in the model so that you don't bias your results. So let's see this in practice. Let's see an example of this fit. Uh, so let's go to our GitHub, and we will go to the weak lensing part. Uh, okay. So just open the weak the the um, my binder. Maybe I'll have to go through it again. So you click on the weak lensing. I think I have to try. I try to let it there, but bear with me. If you have questions so far, yes, that's a good moment for the question since binder would take maybe a couple of I minutes. have a, a small question. Um, this, um, I mean, I be, well, this uh, formalism in which you consider this um, background, there matter contribution to the main halo, this halo of one and two. The first question is, do you use, this, do you use a, a press sector like formalism to, to, to consider this uh, the extra component from the background? For the two halo term, yes. yes. I guess, or yes. because it's semi-analytic, right? It's like uh, yes, it's it's a projector that you use to measure a bias that enters in the relation between the power spectrum and the good. yeah and the mass. And then there is this also may be used to test uh, this because it's, it, this is uh, um, cosmological model dependent, right? This may be interesting also to, to right. test. Uh, I don't know. For example, lambda CDM versus lambda WDM. For example. So the, the sensitivity to this two halo term, it's it's uh, not very strong. So uh, you are not able to. Um, yes, what you're saying is that this two halo term depends on the cosmology because it depends on the power spectrum. Yeah. It also depends on the bias and so on. So you have a cosmological sensitivity there, yeah. uh, but you are not very sensitive to the to the halo term. So it's it's uh, important enough to make a correction, but yeah. the size of this correction is you are not sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. It's not yet. So you, you use the cosmology to, to take it, to it into account, mm. but you cannot extract the cosmology from it. Okay. But yeah. I you could, yeah. So I've opened it, this notebook from uh, Elizabeth Gonzalez that's uh, coming back from, uh, from Spain now. So maybe she's traveling at somewhere from Buenos Aires to Cordoba. But she prepared this, uh, this uh, um, little um, um, notebook for us. Um, so 
what, what it does, it will read a pre-computed density profile, a, a, a density contrast profile uh, that is previewed from the data. Of course, it takes a lot of time to do all this processing of the data, so we, we are not doing that, but we are just reading uh, uh, this profile, okay? So this is delta sigma uh, of, uh, as a function of R. The uh, orange dots are the, the, the values with the error bars uh, by bootstrapping, and the gray ones are this uh, um, cross component that they should be zero. So it's a way of uh, uh, checking the, uh, the, the quality of your data for systematics. They should be consistent with zero, okay? So now she will introduce a delta sigma model, so the one halo term, naval franker white model, okay? Uh, and she just fits this, uh, this goes really fast. Uh, she just fits the curve by, by this. Um, these are the parameters that result from the fit of a single profile, right? Uh, so now you can overlay the, fleet, the fit with the, with the data. So the fit is the black curve and you see the data. There is sort of a deficit here of, um, in the data, right? And this could be due to miscentered objects. Um, so she's using a, a galaxy cluster catalog that has a, a, a probability of miscentering. So now you can get a better centered system just by, by cutting on this quantity. So just get uh, better centered systems. Oops. Uh, so these are, uh, you have a cut on the probability of the miscentering, and then you can compare the two. Um, Okay, so these are some differences you see here between the, the, the fitted mass and, and density and, and concentration parameters because of getting only uh, systems that are well-centered, which are those uh, that are violet here, okay? Uh, but you, you may be wondering what's the fact here if these points are sensitive to this two halo term. So you can include the two halo term. I will not go into the details here. And, and uh, I forgot to, to, like here, the two halo term is here, okay? So let's consider this two halo term, go back and fit. This will take a little bit more time to compute, uh, or maybe not so little. Okay, we, we are running out of time, so, okay, you can run this yourself, have fun. If you have questions, just let us know. And uh, I think we have to go to the end because there is another workshop here. So let me go to maybe skip to some concluding remarks and, uh, okay. So uh, we won't discuss anything about large scale structure. Uh, okay, okay, so this room will not be used, but may, there may be some people from here that want to attend the next workshop. So yeah, in any case, let's wrap up. And uh, everyone feel free if they want to go to the, the next uh, uh, workshop on the primordial black holes. But just to wrap up a little bit, so gravitational lensing has become in the past decade or two decades really a very useful tool for astrophysics and cosmology as I tried to, to, to show from planets to large scale structure. By the way, now I, I love stars, not only because they let us measure the PSF, but because they tell us about the microlensing uh, events, right? So I, I like stars in our galaxy. I, I, I'm uh, more emotionally connected to our galaxy, which I didn't like to use, except the fact that we need to be perhaps in a galaxy to, to have life. Um, so the idea here was by no means to make a, you know, a, a review of the field of the many, many, many applications and, and results on the field, but rather to give some illustrations where you could you know, at least make some calculations or have a hint of what's going on uh, really uh, and, and, and have, go through these work at examples that you can follow either on the calculations on the slides or on the codes. Um, the idea was really to make some specific use case and, and, and solutions that you can uh, have a sense with your hands on, on what's going on. Uh, many, many subjects were left uh, uh, behind. Very important subjects about measuring H naught with time delays uh, and many other things. Uh, I didn't discuss the use of gravitational telescopes in astrophysics and many challenges that we face, like finding the systems. And anyway, so uh, just some selected topics here. Uh, but what I would like to stress is that this is a really interdisciplinary field. Uh, which involves, you know, from fundamental physics, as we discussed today about dark matter models and so on, uh, to data reduction, processing, um, a lot of statistics, uh, simulations, with theories, and analytic model. So there is really room for all, all kinds of interests, of all kinds of, of skills, um, a lot of, of, uh, of uh, really 
uh, work is needed so that we take profit of the data that's currently available and especially upcoming now. Uh, and, and something I would like to, to, to mention is that, uh, yeah, is that, okay, we, we are always mentioned like these large surveys uh, that gather good data for all this interesting science. And of course, we need these large uh, projects with a lot of, of uh, uh, large instruments, a lot of money, and a lot of people working together. And, and I would like to stress, uh, um, because I'm a bit old, so I can, I can tell how these things evolved in time. And I think we have uh, improved our culture of collaboration and, uh, and of uh, dealing with uh, personal life within the collaboration. So I think that's a good progress in science that's not just um, uh, with respect to all this uh, uh, technology, but more on the human side, uh, I think that um, now these large collaborations have a uh, um, concern with equity, with diversity, with inclusion, uh, harassment, and many, many problems uh, uh, you know, uh, that we know that are present in everyday life and in the academics also. Um, and so I think this is also something to be uh, stressed on this new culture of large collaborations, not only we can do great science with great data, and we need a lot of people to work, uh, but there is this atmosphere, at least a concern, to improve uh, the, the, um, the personal side of this atmo uh, working atmosphere. So uh, just to uh, invite you to get involved in this, this way of doing science. Uh, okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit uh, uh, behind the time. Uh, but I'm taking questions. Again, if you want to leave, just be um, free, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. And if there are no questions for now, feel free to ask them during the Discord uh, channel. At least until the end of this meeting, Friday, uh, we'll be checking the Discord, OK? Or by email or anything. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, sir. So thanks so again thanks for your again. audience. Thanks for patience. Thanks for hearing me talking so much. Appreciate it. So last call for questions. OK, bye-bye. Have a nice afternoon.